Greetings, friends. It is my pleasure to welcome you today, uh, virtually anyway, to the Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies located at the University of Notre Dame. My name is Garrett Fitzgerald, and I am the Ethics, Politics, and Community Justice Fellow here at the Institute. I want to extend a special welcome today to those who are joining us as part of the university's Walk the Walk Week programming, and also to members of the Crocs uh, Global Alumni Network who are joining us on the call today. Today's presentation is part of a series linked to the Croc Institute's multi-year strategic commitment to bringing intersectional approaches to peace and justice to the center of our research and teaching agendas. Over the course of this year, we are featuring scholar practitioners whose attentiveness to the complex overlap of multiple social identities underscores the indispensability of an intersectional lens for engaging in peace research, practice, and educational efforts. Today's talk, featuring Dr. K. Melkor Quick Hall, is entitled Transnational Black Feminism and the Pursuit of Peace. Dr. Hall is the author of Naming a Transnational Black Feminist Framework, Writing in Darkness, and the co-editor with Wynne Kirk of Mapping Gendered Ecologies, Engaging with and Beyond Eco-Womanism and Eco-Feminism. She's a popular educator who works with students of all ages and holds degrees from Sarah Lawrence College, Temple University, and American University. Currently, she is teaching mathematics to middle and high school students in Boston. Hall is also the interim executive director of the African American Education and Research Organization and the Milk or Quick Meeting House, both organizations founded by her mother, as well as a resident scholar at Brandeis University's Women's Studies Research Center. Dr. Hall's presentation today will be interactive, and so we encourage you to use the chat feature to participate during those segments. We'll also have some time after Dr. Hall's remarks for Q&A, as we encourage audience members to hold any further questions or reflections you have until Dr. Hall's presentation is concluded, at which point we will be moderating the queue. And so with that, Dr. Hall, we are thrilled to share this time with you today, and we'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, um, Garrett, for this invitation, and, and thank you all for coming. Uh, I wasn't sure how many people would come. Uh, many people are all zoomed out, and so I'm, I'm excited to see everyone here. Um, and I'll just, I'll start by saying, uh, Garrett has told everybody to hold their, their questions, and part of the reason for that is that I have questions for you. Um, he, you know, I've, I've been, um, named as a sort of popular educator, and I take that quite seriously, that this isn't um, it's a performance, um, but instead it's an opportunity for us to engage in a conversation, a, a conversation about international relations, about peace, about feminism, about transnational, um, transnationalism. And so I look forward to that conversation. And in fact, anytime I, I talk about the book, it's never quite the same because it's important to me to hear what people have to say about the concepts um, that I'm raising. And so um, what I will do today, and I'm, I'm going to share my screen is I'm going to talk through uh, some concepts, concepts of a transnational black feminism. And I'm going to ask you to consider some uh, questions that are connected to peace and that are also related to the, the principles that I, that I bring up. And so I'm gonna ask you to put some things in the chat and then we'll see how it, how it goes from, from there. Um, as has already been mentioned, I'm, I'm a resident scholar at Brandeis University's Women's Studies Research Center. And so that's my contact information. If you have questions at some point or later on wanna, wanna reach out to me. So um, I've already said uh, what I'm gonna say about popular education. Um, I am here uh, in, in order to engage you, in order to continue learning about these ideas and to talk to you as, as peace students, activists, practitioners about how these principles might be connecting to the work that you're doing. And so I'm really excited to be here for that reason. Um, I am going to talk about international relations as poetry. I'm going to walk through the guiding principles of a transnational black feminist framework. I'm going to talk about living and learning beyond the academy. And finally, I'm going to end with um, a quote about dangerous art. So my greatest aspiration for this book, naming a transnational black feminist framework, writing in darkness, is that it would rise to the level of poetry, not the kind of poetry that is superfluous, but the kind that is central to envisioning alternative futures. Audre Lorde wrote about this kind of poetry in an essay entitled, Poetry is Not a Luxury. I'll read an excerpt, open quote. For women then, poetry is not a luxury. 
It is a vital necessity of our existence. It forms the quality of the light within which we predicate our hopes and dreams towards survival and change. First made into language, then into idea, then into more tangible action. Poetry is the way we help give name to the nameless so it can be thought. The farthest horizons of our hopes and fears are cobbled by our poems carved from the rock experiences of our daily lives. If what we need to dream, to move our spirits most deeply and directly toward and through promise is discounted as a luxury, then we give up the core, the fountain of our power, our womanness. We give up the future of our worlds." End quote. My book seeks to name something, a collective thing without name that is already felt. The book represents the beginning of its birth to the Black feminist body. That Black feminist body is dark, ancient and deep. In this sense, darkness should not be seen as a generative source. It should be seen as a generative source for production, a womb for the birthing of things yet to be named. I've named the object being birth as a transnational black feminist framework because naming is an important part of welcoming new beings or ontologies into worlds. This particular name honors blackness not as the only generative source for the framework, but as the end of a color spectrum so reviled in a white supremacist context that it must be named in any radically liberatory response. Transnationalism is centered as a paradigm that cuts across the hierarchies of the international or governmental, often out of reach for the most marginalized among us. Black feminism is the living, breathing body birthing the framework. And so that's a quote from the book. And I here I'll pause and say that um, this is where I talk about what it means to be living in feminist legacies. And today I've decided to talk about um, how deeply indebted I am to the work of early Black feminists um, as is highlighted throughout the text um, and, and women of color feminist, um, tr transnational feminist. So in this context here, when reflecting on a conversation about peace, I want to acknowledge the work of Margot Okazawa Ray, who was one of the members of the original was one of the original members of the radical Boston-based Black Lesbian Combahee River Collective. If you're a feminist scholar, you will know the um, Combahee Collective statement. Um, it's one of the founding texts of, of feminist um, scholarship. As a world-renowned anti-militarism activist, Okazawa Ray has written and spoken extensively about what is required in our search for an enduring peace. The following is a quote from her 2002 article, Warring on Women, Understanding Complex Inequalities of Gender, Race, Class, and Nation. Open quote. At the root of military violence against women are the complex inequalities of gender, race, and ethnicity, and class imperialism, colonialism, and neocolonialism, and the central role of the military in the operation of those systems. In understanding military violence, US-based anti-violence and peace activists must incorporate the concept of nation and national privilege into our analyses. There are power relations, inequalities, and privileges rooted in the interrelationship among countries, in the relationship of countries to all First Nations or Indigenous peoples. This interrelationship is based on the oppression and exploitation of countries of the South by countries of the North." End quote. And so this quote makes clear that the principles of the transnational Black feminist framework um, were established well before the writing of, of this text. It was um, in reading Black feminist texts and observing Black feminist transnational activism that I was compelled to name a set of principles that have been guiding the work of transnational Black feminists for years. And so today I look forward to a discussion about these five principles. The first one, and I'm sure many of you have heard of these, <laughs> intersectionality. So intersectionality considers interconnected connected axes of identity, oppression, privilege, um, it pushes us to consider how various systems are working together. So you are an audience that thinks about peace. And I'd like to return to the beginning of this Okazawa Ray quote, which read, open quote, at the root of military violence against women are the complex inequalities of gender, race, 
in ethnicity and class, imperialism, colonialism, and neocolonialism, and the central role of the military in the operation of those systems. And so I'm going to ask you this is the first prompt that I'm asking you to put something in the chat for. But I'd like for you to reflect on how this country's prioritization of military budgeting and war are contributing to particular forms of violence that are not explicitly about war. And I want you to type your reflection about that into the chat. And it can be a word or two, no more than you know, a, a sentence. But so the, the challenge here, the prompt here, is to reflect on how this country, the US, prioritize military budgeting and, and war in a way that contributes to forms of violence that are not explicitly about war. I'll just pause for a minute and hope that one or two people will put something in the chat. Thank you, and I'm, I'm, I, I appreciate some of these comments that I'm seeing, and I, and I think that this is the this is the kind of way that we have to think about principles like this. Um, I forgot to advance my slide, so I'll just do that now. The second principle is scholar activism, hyphenated. Um, and I mentioned that it's hyphenated because I'm, I intend to use it as an intersectional concept. Um, so not an additive, in the additive sense that I do scholar and scholar work in one place and activism in another place, but that the two things inform one another. Um, Julia Sudbury and Margot Ogazar Ray co-edited a text entitled, uh, titled Activist Scholarship, Anti-Racism, Feminism, and Social Change that examined the relationship between scholarship and activism. As it relates to questions of peace, I believe that too often there is a narrow focus on war-torn areas in examining what might be required for peace. I challenge this audience to consider what we can learn from locations such as the US that are not described as necessarily being at war in, in the conventional sense, even as they are dominant powers that influence policing and militarization and war around the world. And so the question here, I'll advance the slide this time so that you, you can have the prompt here. The question here is what is the role, what is your role as a peace scholar, activist, advocate, or practitioner in, in, who is connected to a US-based institution? And you might be an alum, you might be a student, you might be a faculty member. In what ways can and should your connection to this place and, and your position and, and privileges that are connected to this place, to this US-based institution, um, be used to move us all closer to peace. So again, what is your role as a peace scholar, activist, advocate, or practitioner who is connected to a US-based institution? And in, in what ways can and should policies here that emanate from a place such as the US move us closer to peace. I'll again pause for just a moment. And the idea here is just that where you're located matters and that there's a particular kind of engagement that should be coming from out of, coming from and out of countries such as the US. Thank you. And I like, I appreciate what I see in the chat is is connecting these two principles, which is really the richness of thinking about the framework as a whole. So the next principle is solidarity. So we recently lost a, a, a Black feminist legend, um, Bell Hooks, who's left us with the treasure of many texts. One of her insights, um, is about providing uh, information about the distinction between the idea of support and solidarity. I'm gonna quote something that she said. 
Support can be occasional, but solidarity requires ongoing commitment. I'm gonna repeat that. Support can be occasional, but solidarity requires ongoing commitment. And so the question here, the prompt in, in, in relationship to this idea is for whom is peace? On whose behalf are we advocating when we advocate for peace? And how does your scholarship or practitioner work embody a sustained commitment? How are you being held accountable for sustaining such commitments? I'll repeat that. For whom is peace? On whose behalf are you advocating or doing your practitioner work? How does your scholarship embody a sustained commitment? And how are you being held accountable for sustaining such commitments? And it's okay to put in the chat if you are not being held accountable, but the question is for us to be engaging in work that is about solidarity, it can't just be a matter of responding to events at our convenience. It has to be connected to sustained and ongoing commitments. And I'll pause just a moment for you to put one or two things in the chat about how you're thinking through solidarity and peace. Thank you. So the next principle is attention to borders and boundaries. Natural and unnatural boundaries, including rivers and country borders are often locations of intense conflict. Gloria Anzaldúa theorized borderlands that exist, open quote, wherever two or more cultures edge each other, where different people of where people of different races occupy the same territory, where under, lower, middle, and upper classes touch, where the space between two individuals shrinks with intimacy, end quote. Anzo Dua wrote, open quote, borders are set up to define the places that are safe and unsafe, to, to distinguish us from them. A border is a dividing line, a narrow strip along a steep edge. A borderland is a vague and undetermined place created by the emotional residue of an unnatural boundary. It is in a constant state of transition. The prohibited and forbidden are its residents." End quote. Also, uh, Chandra Mohanty, describes a uh, feminism without borders as both acknowledging the open quote, the fault lines, conflicts, differences, fears, and containment that borders represents, that borders represent, end quote, while envisioning open quote, change in social justice work across lines of demarcation and division. So there's a tension here. So I'll repeat that. Mohanty talks about feminisms without borders as both acknowledging the fault lines, conflicts, differences, fears, and containment that borders represent while envisioning change in social justice work across lines of demarcation and division. And here, the prompt to, to be engaged for us to consider is how can peace practitioners advance a feminism without borders? In what ways must peace extend across borders? So it's very easy to think about peace as, as being, you know, sort of brokered between two um, well-defined entities. But the question here is how can peace practitioners, scholars advance a feminism without borders? In what ways must peace extend across borders, transcend borders? And I'll pause a moment for you to consider that. And, write a word or two of reflection in the chat. So the last principle is radically transparent author positionality, which is just a bit of a mouthful. And I have to, I have to say that um, it, part of the reason why I was thinking about this principle in particular is because I found that when people were 
being challenged to position themselves that often people would repeat the same thing no matter the context. And I was wanting people to give more relevant information about the particular issue that we might be discussing. So, you know, if, if we're talking about wealth and you are one of the members of, of the wealthiest family in the country, that that would be what you would mention, not necessarily some other thing that you, you, you know, become accustomed to rehearsing in terms of how you position yourself. And so radical transparent positionality is important because it allows us to be honest about our privileges and our limitations. Through this principle, I'm advocating a rare sort of transparency that reveals the mechanisms behind one's work, which is not always made completely transparent in, in particular in, in scholarly work. And I'll return to the quote that I began with from Margo Okazawa Ray, um, the last part of her quote it reads, in understanding military violence, US-based anti-violence and peace activists must incorporate the concept of nation and national privilege into our analyses. There are power relations, inequalities and privileges rooted in the interrelationship among countries and the relationship of countries to all First Nations or indigenous peoples. The interrelationship is based on the oppression and exploitation of countries of the South by countries of the North, end quote. And so the prompt in, in relationship to this principle is in what ways do your connections to the US undermine your peace work? And so, uh, in what ways do you do you do your connections provide access and opportunities um, to information and people? And are you willing to publish your biases and privileges alongside your, the limitations of your work? Again, I'll repeat that. In what ways do your connection to the U.S. undermine your peace work? In what ways do your connections provide access and opportunities to information and people? And are you willing to publish your biases and privileges alongside the limitations of your work? And again, I'll pause briefly for people to consider that and put it to the chat in reflection. So when I think about these together, um, one, I oh, sorry about that. <laughs> one, I wanted, to say that um, it's always important to be thinking about living legacies to honor um, not just mentors uh, such as Margot Gazelle Ray, but also to honor the work of the Honduran Gerifuna Araba makers, um, who are Araba is a Gerifuna word for cassava bread. And, and I spent uh, 10 months engaging that community of women around the idea of grassroots development and that um, in relationship to, to women's work um, and have continued thinking about women's work and development and um, peace and food. Uh, I think someone mentioned food earlier in the chat um, through my current work, which, which connects that community in Honduras to another community in Tanzania by looking at questions of food sovereignty. And so that's um, what I'm engaging now. But I think that the work of connecting across borders is quite urgent. And um, I'm sure that many of you are already engaging your work in that way, but I think it would be great for us to think about how we might shift our writing research praxis in ways that are more transnational. Um, I, I don't think that we can afford to be shy about possible paths to, to peace, but I think that um, we can think about other ways that we can um, connect across borders. Um, let's see. All right. So, um, Stefano Harney and Fred Moten wrote about the complicated relationship of the subversive intellectual to the university. 
under the heading, the only possible relationship to the university today is a criminal one, open quote. But certainly this much is true in the United States. It cannot be denied that the university is a place of refuge and it cannot be accepted that the university is a place of enlightenment. In the face of these conditions, one can only sneak into the university and steal what one can, to abuse its hospitality, to spite its mission, to join its refugee colony, its gypsy encampment, to be in but not of, this is the path of the subversive intellectual in the modern university. After all, the subversive intellectual came under false pretenses with bad documents out of love. Her labor is as necessary as it is unwelcome. The university needs what she bears but cannot bear what she brings. And on top of all that, she disappears. She disappears into the underground, the down low, low down maroon community of the university into the undercommons of enlightenment where the work gets done, where the work gets subverted, where the revolution is still bat black, still strong, end quote. So I didn't want this book to be judged primarily by professional association awards or scholarly critique. Instead, I hope that it will will be measured by the capacity to move forward transnational solidarity work that will advance liberation struggles. The manuscript honors the spirit of networks powered by women of color, networks designed to nourish our communities and expand life's options. It is humbly written in solidarity, incomplete and awaiting the chorus of voices that might accompany it, made inspire in the spirit of a June Jordan poem, a Lorraine Hansberry play, a Sweet Honey in the Rock song, in Octavia Butler's story. May it be recorded as part of the soundtrack of the freedom movement. In this vein, it is in this vein that I considered how this book might generate new living feminist legacies. And at the beginning of the global health pandemic, I launched an online transnational black feminist series having canceled all conventional book tour events, um, and I did so with the following tagline. Just as peace is more than the absence of war and freedom is more than the absence of enslavement, Black lives are so much more than the absence of Black death, um, I, end quote. And I, I've learned so much from the conversations that I've had with a series of Black feminist activists and artists um, I'll just name them here um, and, and feel free to ask me questions if you, if you want about any of these talks. Um, first was Mayori Holmes of Black Star uh, Film Festival. Next was artist Daryl Ann Gay McCalla. Then was Candace Montgomery of Black Visions Collective. Next was singer Nadelka Prescott. Next was Dawn Crandall from Brask Burlesque, Brown Ass Burlesque. Uh, next was Leah Pinneman of Soul Fire Farm. Then came Michelle Chapman of Black Mindfulness Summit. Then performing artist, Dale Hamilton. Then activists, Afro-Latina activists, Yvette Morostini. Um, then Nancy Misunzi, photographer, artist. Uh, then Diana Njai of the Will to Adorn Project from the Smithsonian. And finally, Ashley Henderson of Highlander Research Center. And so I was really honored to be able to discuss these principles with this lineup of 12 um, Black feminists who, who engaged in the conversation. Finally, began the, began the conversation with an Audre Lorde, Lorde quote about poetry and I will um, end with a, a quote from novelist Edwige Stantica. Open quote, creating dangerously for people, create dangerously for people who read dangerously. This is what I've always thought it meant to be a writer. Writing, knowing in part that no matter how trivial your words may seem, someday, somewhere, someone may risk his or her life to read them, end quote. The transnational Black feminist framework is an international relations intervention that writes Black feminist theory and practice into a white patriarchal canon by focusing on the principles of intersectionality, scholar activism, solidarity, 
attention to borders, boundaries, and radically transparent author positionality. The transnational Black feminist principles discussed in this talk can and should be used by others within and outside the academy. The focus is freedom. We, continue, we must continue moving towards liberation, engaging the living legacies of the feminist artists and activists who have already brought us so far. Creating dangerously is an art. This art is not a luxury and our futures are on the line. And I just have a thank you slide. These are some of the texts that I referenced. Um, there's a website, writinginddarkness.org if you want to um, order a, an autographed copy of the book or you want to see information about some of um, some of the work, the, some of the work that is an extension of this book and of this talk. And I will stop share there so that we can engage in, in conversation and more questions. See. So. Dr. Hall, thank you so much um, for sharing these insights with us and for bringing us some really important and urgent questions um, to our, our work and our conversations here at Croc. Um, so I, I mentioned at the, the top of the session, so we do have some, some time for Q&A to continue, broaden or deepen um, some of these questions that Dr. Hall has brought up for us. So please use the, the chat function uh, or the raise hand feature. Um, we also had a couple of questions that came in um, from the registration process. So maybe one of those to just uh, go ahead and get us started. Um, but one of our, our registrants asked, is there only one transnational Black feminism, or might it make sense to think of transnational Black feminisms? Um, how would you respond to that? Yeah, I mean, I, I say naming A, <laughs> transnational Black feminist framework instead of B. And certainly, I mean, um, you know, in the text, you'll find that I'm deeply indebted to Black feminist anthropologists, um, you know, many of whom are colleagues and peers. And so, uh, and I'm not sure what thing we would describe as their own, you know, it, as only there being there being one of it, you know, I mean, we could almost say that for anything, right? So, um, yeah. And I'm even even this framework, even as I talk about this as being one one path to thinking about it, it is a framework that I'm hoping is a living, breathing framework that I had this year of conversations with people. I'm really deepened it, and when I when I get a moment, um, I want to even write an article about how those conversations have shifted how I'm thinking about the principles in action. Thanks. Um, we had another question that came in asking uh, where you think public discourse around equal rights might be leading, uh, and so maybe some of the advantages or limitations of, of rights discourse as a way of fostering the sort of um, radical equality and equity uh, that your work promotes. That's a tough question. And I mean, and part of it depends. I don't know if that person is here, but I mean, part of it depends on on who on who you're listening to and um, you know whose whose rhetoric you're following. I mean, I think that certainly um, position matters and and what people are asking for and where they're located when they're asking for it is is part of the analysis. And so um, I engaged in constructivist grounded theory in my own dissertation work. I, I believe very deeply in the connection between theory and praxis. And so um, I think that it's it's sometimes easy to, to attack, you know, attach yourself to, to principles and then find that their grounding is not is not so just in implementation. So um, I'd be interested to know, you know, with that but that per the person who wrote the question, if they're on the call, is you know, is thinking about in terms of that. Yeah. Great, thanks. Um, I'm seeing uh, a couple other questions in the chat. Um, what is the question that says, uh, how can an activist be an educator, uh, followed by the claim that bias should not be an education? Uh, and so could you maybe unpack that, that idea for us a little bit? Yeah, so um, uh, Bias is in education, and it's and it's in every everything we, we we say. And so I think that the the best educators are are those who reveal their bias and who work hard to share it. I think that um, you you can't have any set of life experiences and think that you aren't shaped by that. And think that, I mean I mean I've talked to people who 
grew up reading books from the U.S. about playing in the snow, but never experienced snow until they were adults who came to visit at a later age. I mean, there's there's also always some way that your experiences shape your description of the world and how you understand it. And so um, I, you know, I, I don't believe that uh, that we speak without bias. And so I think that the best we can do is help people to understand how our particular set of experiences have, sh have shaped the bias that we introduce into a particular conversation. That's terrific. Um, we have a question here in the chat. Uh, could you talk a bit more about what you were learning from your work in Tanzania and Honduras, especially regarding food sovereignty? I'd also love to hear more about that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, um, so one of the things, well, two of the things that I really, at the end of the text that I really talked about being inspired by and wanting to see more of in terms of transnational solidarity were questions uh, engaging food sovereignty and how we're thinking about that across borders and also reproductive justice. And so I had the opportunity to uh, participate in this project um, about transnational Black women's food sovereignty, connecting the work of one of the groups, one of the cassava cooperatives who I'd worked with previously um, with another group in, in Tanzania. And to me, that's important because it really does challenge the questions of borders and geography. And also it is going to be an opportunity to share local food ways across geography, across language um, and in Tanzania in the area where the project is, the language spoken is primarily Swahili um, in the Gerifuna community, it's primarily Gerifuna. I have not decided if I'm going to try to caption in any way these images and videos. And if so, whether I would try to have captions in English, Spanish, Swahili, and Gerifuna. But for right now, <laughs> the images alone allow the women to share experiences in ways that they're excited to participate in, and I'm excited to be able to facilitate this. And I'm hoping that this work actually grows and connects to some of the work that I've been doing before um, around food sovereignty, in particular through uh, organizations such as Soul Fire Farm and the Northeast Farmers of Color. Um, I'm sure that some of your group here knows of the work of Leah Penniman. Um, and, and so I, I'm, I'm hoping that ultimately this will be something that can facilitate a sort of broadening of US networks to um, international networks of specifically women who are providing food for family and communities in ways that um, are important and often make them quite vulnerable if you think about getting water to a particular community or that kind of thing. Yeah. Wonderful. Thanks. Um, an another question in the chat. Um, I'm sure echoing what, what many of us are, are thinking, still kind of wrestling with the, the good questions you gave us. But um, do you have any strategies or how would you recommend those of us living in the US coming from privileged spaces, for example, like the University of Notre Dame, um, to be further in solidarity um, with impacted communities with whom we work or who we study, um, and also to help us in unpacking that radically transparent positionality that you described? Are there any tips or strategies? Yeah, I mean, I, I part of um, what has been really important to me is building deep, sustained relationships with people from other parts of the world. I think that um, I have. I have written about and critiqued in some places IRB processes, but uh, I will just say institutional review board processes for, for those who aren't in the academy, which is the ethical review of one's research. And often researchers are encouraged to think of themselves as going into a community, extracting what they need. You give the community members some way to contact some IRB board if there's some uh, ethical concern, but most of the time people don't think about themselves as having 
the sort of ongoing relationship with communities. And I think that we have to step back from that kind of model and think about the ethical implications of that kind of work that involves extraction of knowledge from a community, the legitimization of that extraction through IRB processing and informed consent and the essentially the building of one's career off of that, that kind of knowledge extraction um, without further follow-up and engagement. And so much of my, my work in the extension of my work um, from, from the initial time in Honduras came from sustained relationships with communities, came from talking to women after I left about the challenges of having clean water in the home, talking to people about how they were feeding themselves in the context of the pandemic, um, thinking through what kind of relationship did I need to have to people in order for our collective survival to be prioritized. And so I think that it's tempting to try to come to a solution resolution on one's own, but that in fact, it's quite important to engage in a process uh, where you open yourself up to critique, where you engage uh, communities about the, the circumstances and you reflect on, if your circumstances aren't the same, reflect on how and why that is. Um, because I think that, that, that although there are some places that are really, um, some schools of thought that are really exploring questions of, under development, how one, one community country group uh, participates in extraction that, that is not the, the absence of development, but is actually a, the process that moves in the other direction for the other community. Um, I, I think that that is not um, foregrounded enough in US institutions and in education about how our decisions for, you know, cell phones that we can swap out every two years contributes to child mining for such the minerals that are required for the cell phones. And so I think that that kind of attention to the relationship between US consumption and uh, multinational <laughs> capitalist endeavors contributes to the, the kind of poverty and, and war and tension that often exists around borders, water, um, all kinds of things. Yes, yeah, so I really would say relationship building because people, you know, if you if you open the door and you say you want to have the conversation, I think that many people are prepared to have those conversations, but you just have to be ready to to do that and to engage. Yeah, that's great. And so, and so picking right up on some of the themes from that response, um, we had a respondent who was really taken with the idea of the the border space and kind of the idea of, of crossing or blurring borders. Um, but had a question about how to grapple with the linguistic or cultural translation this entails um, without relying on or reinforcing particular, you know, potentially violent or hierarchical um, ways of knowing and being. Um, and so could you say a little bit more to that, you know, what, what that, that process of translation involves? Yeah, I mean, I think in there, I'm, they're, they're probably on this call, um, in, in, well, I don't know if they are, but uh, language justice activists, I mean, there's a lot, I mean, I say that as I, as I know that we don't have ASL translation. I mean, I think about all the different and not, <laughs> no, I mean, it's, 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 it's just a consideration, right? So I think that um, translation is complicated and I find that there are some things that are quite frankly, difficult to translate. Like often when I'm talking to um, people who have not traveled to the places where I am about certain aspects of my experience, I find that I don't have the language for something that I don't know that they have the experience of. Um, and and that's, a, that's a, there's a sort of, I think, um, arrogance that people can have about thinking that it's just a matter of finding the right word. But uh, if, you don't if you don't have that type of experience in your daily life, I'm not sure what I would call it. You know, the, the thing that you 
hold your, you know, the, the kind of cup you use to, to scoot with when you're giving yourself a shower? What do you call that in English? I don't know. I mean, my experiences of it, you know, have been, I mean, in, you know, some, in, in not just in English, but in a particular sort of US-based context, right? So I've used it in some places and, and not in others. And um, it's, it, it would be like trying to explain the use of a bidet to someone who'd never had that experience. And they're trying to figure out what's wrong with your toilet, why is it sprouting water? And so I think that, I, I, I think that there are some things that can't be translated and for me, I am really excited about how image and video can be used uh, as a way to share in places that are pretty far apart geographically, but I think are sharing a lot of experiences. Um, and already I've started sharing videos with women um, of the other group and they are seeing themselves in those videos and excited and looking forward to seeing more. They're growing some of the same foods. Um, and so uh, I think that for me, photography is one way to, to make those connections. And I'm hoping that videos will be as well. Um, and so I'll be developed, I'll be sort of putting up those images and videos on a website in the coming months. Yeah. Great. Um, so we still have time for, for a couple more questions. And so uh, I want to encourage folks to continue to add those in the chat. Um, yeah. I want to exercise uh, host prerogative for a second, ask you one question. Um, yes. I, I would love to hear about, you know, we're talking about a, a transnational black feminist framework. Um, within that, I'd love to hear some reflections for you personally on the importance of place. And so I want to connect your work with the, the Milk or Quick Meeting House, Fayetteville, North yeah. Carolina. Um, with this transnational work that you're doing. And so I'd just love to hear some thoughts on, on what it means to be holding that space and that physical space in the context of your broader work. And if you could maybe yeah. tell us a little bit about the, the background of that as well. Right, um, and so uh, the people who, who know me best know that I am a caregiver along with my mother uh, for my grandmother who is 100 and has Alzheimer's um, and so she lives with me now. And also um, this place was her home. And so her, we've made her home into a, a cultural center um, and we hope that people will be able to use it in ways that allow for a kind of exchange of ideas. Um, and also if you, if, I don't know if there's anyone here who's from Fayetteville or nearby, but you might know that Fort Bragg military base is very close to, to Fayetteville. So it's a sort of interesting um, proximity to questions of international relations, certainly questions of peace. And so uh, we have an, an annual symposium that we have there uh, each, each year in August. This year, this past one was, was virtual, but I think that I, especially when people are doing the work of international relations, I think that it's really important to interrogate sort of what's happening where you are literally in your home, um, in, in, in your home country. And so I've been really grateful to have that kind of legacy. My uh, grandmother was an educator. My mother's a retired um, professor of political science and public policy. Um, so there's a really strong legacy of thinking about um, <clears throat> what is the responsibility, responsibility of government, what is the social contract we have with our government, which we expect, um, and, and also to be thinking about what our, in terms of our, our access and privilege to certain kind of resources, what are, what are our, uh, what's our ability to leverage that to create the, the kind of world we want to see. And in my particular family, there's a long history of African Americans getting education. Um, I mentioned that my mom has a PhD uh, from UNC Chapel Hill. My father was a medical doctor. I'm a fifth generation African American terminal degree graduate, series of MDs and PhDs, which in a context where many African Americans are our first generation um, uh, college students. And so the, also the home in that location is an I is is the, the idea of it is a place where we can begin to share 
our understanding of how some of these systems work. I mean, there's the education that you get in school and then there are all of the rules and um, the rules that guide social relationships that get people into other kinds of rooms that aren't classrooms, but that are halls of privilege and access. And so um, through that, through the work of both Arrow African American Education Research Organization, also my quick meeting house idea is to really think about how we can share some of what we know and also learn from others, particular African Americans who are um, who have stories of career and college insight to share with other people who have had less access to that information. Yeah, thank you for asking about that. Of course, um, and and I think picking up again on, on some of the threads from your response there, we've got um, uh, maybe our, our final question here. Um, should we, and if so, how do we speak transnational black feminism to power? Does it confront and displace things like militarism and white supremacy or subvert them from without? Um, I'm gonna say yes, it does both. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't, right, so it's, is it an either or, is it both and, and I think that um, that we can, see, we can, we can look at the work of, of different people and different kinds of organizations. I mean, there's, and I'm talking about a, a feminism without borders. I think that that kind of work can influence people who are working and have direct uh, influence over what happens with different kinds of milita military government bodies. Um, and also it is the kind of thing that advocates and protest and calls for the shifting of funds from a military budget to something else, um, like our survival um, during a pandemic and an economic crisis. Uh, and so I think that it, it does both and the two are, all, are, are related, that if you believe that the, the people, the masses have some power to influence government legislation, then, then that's also a way in which the one becomes the other. And so I think that there's a sort of constant pushing. I mean, certainly in the run up to this election, there were many uh, activists that comes to mind, uh, Barbara Ransby of National Women, former um, president of the National Women's Studies Association, really talking about the fact that it's not about choosing someone to go into the president's office who you, or think you're going to always agree with, but it's about deciding who you think will listen more attentively, more attentively to the demands of the people. And so I think that's the position that we're in. And I think that we have to both advocate from outside and from within. And often people will ask me, well, you know, do you think that there's certain strategic positions we should have? And I say all of them. You know, like I don't, I don't want if I need if I'm if I'm in desperate need of help, I don't want to only have access to people in NGOs. I want there to be someone in a government office who can help. I want someone to be in this corporation who can help. And so I think that uh, I, I'm I'm all for people figuring out sort of what their location it what makes sense for them in terms of their location and also having these conversations across location. That's great. Uh, I, I want to maybe just try to sneak this one last one in. We have a um, uh, uh, question asker joining us from Brazil, uh, an undergraduate IR student from Brazil, um, who says she sometimes feels like the university is very far from community movements uh, that are fighting to survive and has asked how we can transcend that, transcend these borderlines and engage the population in a feminist transnational movement. And so thinking again about how we bring, you know, things out of the halls of the, the academy make those connections. Yeah, and I have to admit, I mean, people, you know, if we talk about my position, where am I located? Uh, I would say that I'm sort of on, on the margins to the edge of the academy. I mean, I, I, at this point, am not, I don't have any paid affiliation with a university. So I'm a resident scholar, which means I have an, a, a, a sort of steady affiliation, a three-year appointment connected to, to Brandeis Women's Studies Research Center, but I'm, I'm not pay through there, I, I get to access the library and have some other benefits. Um, and I think that part of what we have to do is, is if you're on the inside, then you cross the line, you invite those community activists to give a talk at your, in your class, if you're teaching, if you're, if you're a TA, um, or you 
take your students or give them the assignment to go out to the street, you know, to go out to the protest or to engage uh, questions that are being asked by those movements, have them participate in data collection for some, for some policy that is relevant locally or transnationally. I mean, trans locally, right? I mean, I think that the question is, uh, the, the, the borders and boundaries function in part because people respect them. But if we, if we refuse to acknowledge them, if we act as though they don't exist, then we can create another reality. And so I think that, um, yes, many, many universities don't respect the community movements, but if the students who are paying tuition insist upon it, then we have a new reality emerging. I mean, you can think about that in terms of divestment of fossil fuels. You can think of it in terms of any number of things, any a number of shifts that universities have made in recent years because students demanded it. And so I think that we can't under, un, underestimate the power of students to really create another reality on their campus. Yeah. Well, I, I think it's a fantastic place uh, for us to leave it today. Um, I wanna thank everybody again, uh, who's on the call for joining us today and to invite you to join us for future talks in the series, uh, including our next Zoom event, uh, which will feature Dr. Sarah Schroff from the Lahore University of Management Sciences, uh, delivering a talk titled, Taking Over the Home on Teaching Feminist Theory in Lahore on Thursday, February 3rd. Uh, information on that and other upcoming events can be found at the Kroc Institute website. Um, but for now, please join me in thanking Dr. K. Melko Quick Hall so much again for being with us here today and sharing his thoughts. Thank you. <laughs> Yes, and thank you all. I'm so I was I don't, I don't I don't know what brought you to me, but I'm so glad that that I got the invitation and, and I you know maybe in the future I'll be able to be physically with <laughs> with you all in some capacity. But um, thank you for helping me to reflect on on specifically to honor the work of Margaret Okazawa Ray and her anti Millerism work, but also to be have have the opportunity to reflect on uh, our path to peace. Thank you.